Hello and welcome to our Fire Safety Insights podcast. Today we're going to talk about the value of third-party certification for construction products. I'm Charles Devonish, the Managing Director of Adex on Fire and Smoke Curtains. We design and manufacture a range of fire and smoke curtains that are used across the UK, mainly in the construction industry. And I'm joined today, glad to say I'm joined today by Paul Morell, who can introduce himself. Morning, Charles. I'm indeed Paul Morell, lifetime quantity surveyor, now in remission. Um, I guess just very briefly, um, spent the whole of my life with one practice. Uh, and then after what should have been retirement, went and became the government's chief construction advisor for three years, between 2009 and 2012. Interesting view of the other side of the world. Uh, and these days mostly work on st- strategic issues or governance issues around product, products or the industry as a whole. Very good, very good. What was the one firm that you worked for then? Davis Landon, as was, now, okay. now part of ACOM. Okay, mm-hmm. very good, very good. So we're going to, today we're going to have a look at how third-party certification applies to construction products and the reason or one of the, the main um, things that you'll be aware of as a listener will be the testing for a safer future report that Paul Morell did with Annalise Day, often known as the Morell Day Report, which is um, an incredible, I'd have to say, in-depth look at the status quo and some excellent um, recommendations for the government and industry to take up. So, yeah, just um, give us a bit of a, an overview and, and take us through some of the points. Okay, I'd points be glad to do that. In-depth is a very polite way of saying very long yes, uh, yeah. and, and sometimes potentially tedious. It is quite a deliberate decision, really, to, um, not to make it long, but to make it comprehensive. Uh, and it's a hugely complicated issue, more complex, I think, than everybody had understood when the briefing was set for it. Indeed, the brief was to investigate the UK system for testing the safety of construction products. And one of our rather surprising conclusions is there is no such thing. There isn't a UK system for testing the safety of construction products. There's a system for testing compliance with, with standards where there is one, uh, or one of a certain kind that we'll come back to. So it felt very early on as an issue that would not submit to the three big things that politicians are always looking for. And the decision, therefore, was, and and all the uncertainties of Brexit and not knowing how we would align or not align with Europe in the future, you know, were hugely uh, complicated things that added uncertainty to the whole issue. So the plan really was to produce a report that might provide what I always call a map and a menu through, through the process, you know, that there are choices to be made. Um, but there's nonetheless a route through. So what's the route and what are the choices you have, you're forced to make as a government or, an in, or a manufacturer or an industry as a whole uh, along the way? Um, and I think the simple route through and to try and offer a map is the kind of building blocks of what a good system would look like. Um, and uh, I think those are, and, and I've settled down you know, since the report really onto these things, First of all, there needs to be some kind of standard that a product is made to. Um, and there are, by the way, issues and difficulties with each of these building blocks. Uh, the issue with standards is that not uh, they're not all fit for purpose. You know, I always quote Tom Peters' example of a concrete life jacket. You know, you could make a perfect life jacket yeah. out of concrete over and over and over again. Yes. Uh, and you could have it QA processed and, you, and ISO 9001 that we might come back to would certify yeah. that you'd use the right processes. Yeah. But actually the product wouldn't be that much use. No. So um, We have that, um, we t- we touched on it, but we've heard that, haven't we, about industry making standards for... For industry, basically, as well. That's always something that has Yeah, been we might said. come back to that. I think there's an undue degree of cynicism about that. Yes, but but yeah. nonetheless, they are under-informed by science. Yeah. I think that, and I think that will come out of the Grenfell Inquiry, by the way, yes, that you know, yes. the scientists will say, you know, that, that it's too much the product of commercial negotiation rather than scientific performance or technical yeah. performance of the product. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't bring that into sort of to, to slight standards. We're now on some of the BSI National Committees for Standards going mm-hmm. forward and hoping to contribute to them. But just from somebody looking looking at standards from outside to in may have that cynicism. Um, mm. Our point is is that, um, you know, these standards aren't put together by novices. You know, they are put together by people with experience and expertise and knowledge 
um, with the right intent, I would say, more times than not. And they then, are, but they nonetheless are a matter of negotiation. And, yeah. and uh, you know, if you sat on a BSI committee, you must have seen compromise going on to try and reach agreement. Yes, yeah, and there'll yeah. be somebody, no doubt, who, who, who would almost die on the hill of the last concession that needs to be made. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and so in some respects, it isn't a product that does everything it could do. It, no. it's, it's finding a commercial balance. And of course, that becomes a really big issue when you look across the European scene. And leads to the next great big weakness of standards, which is that um, we can't always agree a standard at all. So as I always say when I'm in a trivial mood or a frivolous mood, you know, we, we have a European standard which we apply here rigorously mm. um, for a B-Day, but not for a fire door. Because, mm. because fire doors are so important, we couldn't reach agreement across Europe. Now, as I say, that's a slightly frivolous example, but mm. it, 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 it leads to the point that we only actually get into the whole system of product regulation if there is a sta- so previously harmonised in UK terms mm. a designated standard for it. And about two-thirds of products aren't covered at all. We'll come back to a couple of devices maybe yeah. for, for addressing that. Yeah. So that's the first big building block. Do we have standards? Standards for the product yeah. and standards for testing it. Yeah. And I think uh, the review suggests that the first of those standards, the the product standard, should be performance-based. Whatever you make your product out of and however you make it, it should deliver this performance. Or it says on the tin. Fire separation, fire containment, whatever whatever it might be. But the testing standard should be prescriptive. You must test it in this precise way to demonstrate that it does what you claim it would do. So that's, that's kind of the first building block of a good system, is, is a process. The second one, which starts to move towards your theme of third-party certification, but let's start with statutory certification, is a system that demonstrates independently and reliably that your product does indeed do what you claim it will do. And the, the, every claim that you make of your product should be verifiable, and in respect of products which are subject to uh, regulation, it should have been verified and to a degree independently. So we have we have the famous AVCP system, which, by the way, I hadn't heard of until beginning this review, in spite of being extremely old and having been on building sites since I could walk, because my dad was a builder. So there was revealed the next issue, which is kind of separation between those who understand this world and those who design and construct without being aware of it. And if they're not aware of each other, you know, how, as, as a person who worked in specification or quantification, or even more, had I been a designer, how would I know what I should be looking for when mm-hmm. I test whether a product is appropriate for the use I'm putting it to? Mm-hmm. So there's a kind of separation. So. Um, and then there are issues around the whole testing process. Does it do what it says it would do? Is it independent? And there are suspicions that it hasn't been, uh, which again I think are unduly cynical uh, for the most part. But it certainly doesn't always work. Is that coming out of the mm-hmm. Grenfell inquiry? I mean, that there's some of the suspicions. Yes, I mean yeah. the cynicism might come yeah. out of that. I mean, yeah. I mean, I th- there's, there's a kind of natural suspicion that anybody who works for a fee. Yeah, you know, well, did it give you the answer you want? Well, mm. I worked for a fee the whole of my working mm. life. But I knew very, and even if I, had I been tempted, and, and the way I was brought up, I wasn't, had I been tempted to give you the wrong answer for the right fee, the answer you wanted, and that um, became a habit, my business was finished. No, no, I think, yeah. I think we, um, I think we need to credit, don't we? I think the, the vast majority want to do the right thing, isn't it? And, yes. and we talk about awareness a lot. We say, you know, if we can raise awareness, We'll raise people's, um, or, or, or yeah, if we can, if we can raise awareness, we'll raise levels of safety, which is obviously good for the consumer and yeah. and, and everyone yeah. basically. And you're always going to have bad actors, um, but we can't exactly shape the system for them. That's where you need the enforcement, don't you? And the surveillance, you probably talk about. You're jumping two blocks ahead, yeah, so, 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 but, so no, I don't lose okay. my thread. But we'll come back to it no, because it is critically important. That's good. That's good. Um, but uh, to encourage good behaviour. And I think, by the way, I would say at this point that I would hope that the whole thrust of the government's uh, action would be, and those who, who support the process of, of, of reform and improvement, is to try and create an alliance between the good, mm. to separate them from the bad and, mm. to, and to isolate the bad. We'll come back to that on enforcement, but that has to be a big theme, mm. whereas the theme has slightly become that it's a rotten industry, well, I take offence at that, mm. uh, having spent the whole of my life mm. in it. It isn't a rotten industry, but no. it, it, it's, it's uh, a very unregulated industry and that's led to some bad habits. And it's a very low barrier to entry, entry. I would mm. say if you can afford a wheelbarrow, you can be in the business really. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so my third, we'll perhaps come back to the details of the testing process, that's but it's great, important yeah. that people trust, trust, trust mm. it. And, and one of the sort of subtexts 
that Annalisa and I set was that we you know we need a system that people we still was trust in the system because it clearly uh, uh, if you listen to Grenfell you'd have no trust in it at all. Uh, the next building block has to be the so-called chain of custody. You know that actually a product is followed through its life, and that at least until the point at which it arrives on site the person taking delivery of it can be satisfied that that's the product that's being tested. Absolutely. And that this product will test as well as that one would. There are issues around the AVCP system where you can't necessarily rely on that. Mm. We may come back to that. Because, as I say at this point, the vast majority of products can be tested once, sometimes by a sample made before manufacture, Mm. um, and then launched on the market. Yeah. And as long as you don't change the spec or the means of manufacture, or who does the manufacturing and so on, you can sell that product forever. Mm. It could almost be a prototype, couldn't it? And, we've and, one, that. and it is, and one of the recommendations of the review is that, you know, the very least this should happen it mm. is that a prototype sample mm. should be retested when it's in production. Absolutely, yeah. And we go on to that to say that really, for, for those products that are safety critical, mm. an expression I'm sure we'll come back to, yes. uh, those should be tested routinely throughout the whole, you know, production process of that product. Yeah. So that's kind of weakness in the, in, the, in the AVCP system and the way that it's currently overseen. But the chain of custody needs to be... The so, you know, golden thread is a contributor to the, to the chain of custody. Labelling, you know, honest marketing, which the uh, code launched by the CPA on um, the CCPI code, the Products CCPI, Information yeah. Code, yeah. is a huge contribution towards, yeah. I think, yeah. and it has a couple of critics. I'm not one of them because I don't expect it to be perfect. No. I'm confident that they're in place to improve it as they learn from it. And we'll come back to that too. Constant learning is right at the key of all yes, of this. Yes, yeah. So chain of custody. Can I trust, A, what I'm told as I, as I choose a product, that the information I'm getting includes how to keep it safe, you know, as a manufacturer, you say, this product isn't safe whatever you do with it and however you use it and wherever you put it and however you handle it. You know, you need to give with your product information that keeps it safe. If you do this and handle it in this way, f- design it in in this way, fix it in this way, maintain and operate it in this way, yeah. it will keep doing what we'd say it will do. Yeah. Um, um, and that gets that substitutes the current too frequent excuse, we have no idea how people will use our product, we can't be responsible for that. No, you should know how people yeah, are using it. I mean, we do know because we design it to do a job yeah. in a given situation. Yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> no one should buy that as an excuse, no. I don't think. And you should ha- absolutely have a, a, a feedback process by mm. which you're learning about your yes. product. And we'll yeah. come on to how that actually, I think, could be at the core of a new system. Yeah. The context of, the, of that comment I make there is we're talking about construction products specifically, yeah. not just general consumer products. So, you know, when we design and manufacture a product to go into a building, we know, well, we, des- we, we start with the end in mind. You know, it's obviously one of the great habits to go by, isn't it? You start with the end in mind. So we know, you know, we, we're designing to suit yeah. an application. Okay. So, when I buy something, can I be sure it's what's been tested? You know, the answer at the moment is possibly not. Um, and, and as a designer, can I know exactly how I can use this product and keep it safe? Possibly not. You know, all of that needs to be improved. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a big chunk of work that takes care of, you know, generically in a way, that whole product information thing out there already. Issues before that, you know, is a product ready to market, never mind that. Yes, yeah. we'll, we'll come back to that too. Next building block, and we jumped ahead to it, is, is enforcement. More than one manufacturer said to us during the course of the review, would you please try enforcement first, mm. which is a kind of reaction to all regulation. Mm. Um, uh, and by the way, I'm a fan of regulation that encourages good behaviour yes. and rewards good behaviour uh, and excludes bad. Um, but there's a natural reaction, you know, look, you know to re- regulation, which is sort out all the other people, will you, and leave me alone, I know what I'm doing. <clears throat> Not always true, but certainly sorting out the bad people is a necessary part of a system. And Annalisa and I could not find a single case, and we talked to the police and others, couldn't find a single case of the construction products regulation having been enforced anywhere. Mm. A couple of cases of fraud, you know, stamping a piece of glass, safety glass, when actually you just bought it uh, from the merchant. Um, but no enforcement of the construction products regulation. No, it's good. It's a good point that um, on the um, on enforcement, it's no one exactly wants to see enforcement or, or prosecutions exactly. But if you've got it there as a deterrent, and and people know it will happen, then then hopefully it's actually never needed yeah. in that respect, isn't it? But as you say, is if it's never happened, you know, we, we've heard comments said, oh well, there's never been a prosecution under the CPR, so you know you can essentially disregard it. Well, that's not. 
great. I think you touched on this in the um, fire safety design um, talk you did last year for, in Architects Journal Arranged, um, where basically you've got those that are trying to um, you know do the right thing, they're investing, spending the money in, in the right areas. And then they're obviously at a competitive disadvantage, you know. Um, yeah, nobody wants to compete with someone who's not going to abide no, by the rules. And they no. should they should be comfortable they're in an environment where those people have actually been found out and taken out. Mm. Um, and you know, that, that, that's a key, a key principle, I think. Mm. So it's, it's not just the deterrent force. It is actually right. seeing that people who don't want to play by the rules are taken out of the market. Yeah. And, and in... You know, when we met with the minister, this pre-publication, he asked, you know, kind of how good, how bad his industry is. To which the answer, our answer was, well, it's a slice of humanity. There are three million people have been working in this industry. Mm-hmm. There are saints and sinners, not many of either. Most people are doing the best they can to make a living, mm-hmm. muddling through. 100%. It is a muddled industry, we know that. Yeah. Muddling through, but it's 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 not evil. Um, but you need to fix the, the bad actors. Mm. So that's an important part of a new system. And the, the, the fear, I, I guess, about that is whether we've made a new system, and we'll come back to the whole new environment, post-building safety act, that's more complicated, not simpler. Uh, it places kind of... A, a, we've got a new regulator who I think is determined to get bad product out of the marketplace. Mm. Their eyes the eyes are ears to... The yes, 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 yes. Just for the listeners, yeah. Yeah. Um, not clear what their powers, new powers will be, but you know, they do have powers now and are starting to act on them mm. under the CPR as it currently exists in this country. Yeah. Um, so you know, the more people see that working and happening, the more they'll be, uh, A, encouraged to stick with good behaviours and B, discouraged from staying with bad ones. So uh, that's a good trend, I think. Um, their eyes and ears to a degree, you know, the, the observation part of enforcement, you know, the surveillance part of the enforcement is with trading standards who, for the most part, I think don't want to do it. But let's watch and wait. You know, the government has reserved powers to change the, the regulatory structure. We still need the same people doing basically the same job, but their organisational structure might change. And I'm guessing that that's been put into a power, um, they're giving themselves powers to do that against what might be recommended by the Grenfell Inquiry, because there will be substantive and substantial recommendations coming out of that inquiry. It's probably going to need to be some extra resources. When you talk about trade and standards, is I've heard of some departments in, in bigger cities down to sort of one or two people. You well, know, they're down to zero in some. Oh, oh, you know, some local <laughs> operators do not have a trading standards department. Oh, and of course, right. w- those who have, every year are under pressure to reduce their budget. Mm. You know, So you're making it susceptible to... Uh, local authority budgeting decisions rather mm. than the structure of an industry that's functioning properly. Uh, well, let's not, not, not pick on state trading standards. They do a good job um, in the world that they know and understand. Of course, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I was talking about resourcing, you know. If yeah, it, if, if, it, yeah, it's a big issue, you know. Yeah. But OPSS are being given money for resources and yeah. so on, uh, um, and I think that's is now What understood. size is the team nationally, OPSS? I don't know. I don't know, Absolute. but, you know, it, it's sort of... Um, yeah, I think they've been given a budget of 20 million a year, so okay. whatever that pays for, and that might be a wrong number, forgive yeah. me, but yeah. the, the last no, number okay. I remember seeing, maybe it's an extra 20 million, not yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, anyway, I didn't sense any um, part, any thinking on the part of APSS that if only we had more and more resources, we could do more. They, you know, they, they, they want to be clear what their powers are, yeah. and they want to get stuck in, and, and of course they've got to work with industry, yeah. you know, uh, and they will. That, so... Let's watch and wait for that, but the, you know, the fundamental to, to an improvement in behaviour is... It might is, just be interesting for the for the listener as well, just to mention you were up there yesterday going through this... Um, did you go through some of this report well, with yeah, them? Or, I, yeah, I did or by chance, it? yeah, but um, uh, in reasonably regular correspondence with uh, communication with APSS, yeah. and, uh, and I'm encouraged by that. Yeah, good, yeah. 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 Um, no, it's, but um, they need to know what their powers are, and we might come back to that too. Yeah. Um, next building block is... Kind of body of knowledge. Yeah. Um, if you work in the Middle East, Abu Dhabi, you are presented with a 1,500-page book of regulations on fire safety. And if you don't comply with them, nasty things happen to you of the kind that happens in the Middle East and maybe doesn't happen here. Yeah. yeah. Um, less reluctance to enforce in the Middle East than there is here. I think that's based on the American codes. Yeah. We're never going to have a 1,500-page book of regulations on fire safety here. It's culturally, politically, not the way we do stuff. Mm. 
But nonetheless, everything that's in that book, if it's right, you need to, we need to know. Somebody mm. needs to know. Yes, we need to yeah. produce safe buildings, you know, from, yeah. the, from the width of the access for a fire engine so it can get to the building to yeah. the smallest details of how the arm monger is fixed to a fire door. Mm. Uh, it's all there. Can't find the bod- that body of knowledge here at all. Can't find where it concentrates. In one place. Yeah. yeah. And so we have um, a real issue of... Um, and my sort of last two building blocks are a combination of body of knowledge and feedback yeah. and, and investigation. Yeah. So where is the body of knowledge? Where's the centre of excellence? And you know, either when you ask that question of a room full of people, where's the centre of excellence? Either no hands go out or lots of hands go out, and both, those are two bad things. Yeah, we need to know where to look. Authoritatively, if you're running a business and you want to know everything which is understood about the regulatory environment in which you're working, the experience of fires, for example, you know, and, and every fire brigade does an investigation for every fire, but except in Scotland, that information, or unless somebody dies and you get a coroner's report, that information doesn't go anywhere. Mm. Stays within that single fire brigade. Yeah. So uh, where is it gathered? And we're going to have mandatory reporting. Where does that go? We have cross-reporting you know, on structural safety, which is also a really good programme. You know, where does that go and what new obligations does it create on professionals? Are they expected to know all of that stuff and practice in accordance with it and so on? So where's the body of knowledge being coordinated? And, and this is not looking for a massive control freak centralised organisation, no. but some kind of coordination of the knowledge. A repository, really. Yeah, and resource. I'll come back to yeah. that a bit yeah. too. And, yeah. you know, and what's the information and can I trust it? You know, you know. But say linked to that is the whole business of... I'm pretty sure that almost printed on the cover of the Grenfell Inquiry report will be you... We do not learn the lessons of the past. Mm. Um, and that's, that old saying, history repeats itself by well, definition. Yeah, it does, <laughs> you know, and that, make, that creates anger. Yeah. Um, it should certainly create embarrassment. It creates embarrassment in government that hasn't um, kept the regulations up to date with what it's learned, mm. A, with technological development, and the regulations are falling behind that, but B, with what is being learned from, from uh, the experience of... Um, incidents, I won't call them disasters, mm. they don't yeah. need a disa- shouldn't need a disaster no. um, to learn that what might become a disaster if you don't fix it. Mm. So we don't learn our lessons. Mm. And I'm not sure that we do, because I'm not sure where that happens. You know, where, no. where the, where the centre of excellence and the investigation and the feedback comes from. We have to, as an industry, with government, ideally, because it's a market failure, no single actor is going to say, I must set this thing up, pay for it, and so on. We need something of that sort. And the parallel I draw, or the contrast I draw, is with aircraft investigations. Mm. One of my guilty pleasures is watching air crash investigations. As a consequence of doing that review, you know, that, that I was interested in the parallels um, and the lack of parallels of, of the trouble taken when an air, airline crashes, airliner crashes, to find out why and what can be learned, and to feed that back. Mm. And by the way, not to take the first lesson. In a blame culture of the kind that we have, uh, we are looking to blame the architect or the contractor or the product manufacturer and so on. But these are system failures. And if um, they find in an air crash that the cause might be pilot error, um, and cynical People in aviation tell me that's too often the conclusion because the pilot is usually not there to defend himself or herself. Mm. Nonetheless, the reality of your watch program is, is that once they've decided that was what happened, then they go on to say, why was the error made? Mm. You know, was it about the individual? Was it they were under stress, you know, psychologically disturbed? How do we find that out and stop it? Drugs, alcohol, mm. but more particularly, lack of training, you know, the system that they were required to operate was too complicated. You know, that kind of learning. Root cause analysis, isn't it? Yeah. Good and, question and, for and, it. And the point, the point of that is yes. to stop it repeating, isn't it? And Correct. As opposed to, oh, it was pilot error. What yes. can you do about that? Yeah. yeah. Which is how it used to be about self, health and safety, by the way. You know, yes, yeah. someone falls off a ladder, well, they shouldn't have been up it without a safety line or something. What can you do? What well, can you, you know, can do, do a yeah. lot. No, exactly. Um, yes, yeah. And I've sat in board meetings with, with people, you know, uh, um, talking about health and safety in non-construction businesses and so, and they've got a manual, you know, for something and, and the board asks, do they comply with the process? No. Oh, well, then what can you do? Well, you know, you can look at the process and decide, yeah. is it right? 
how do you make sure people understand it? How do you make sure people act in accordance with it? Mm. So we kind of moved on in health and safety generally, I think. Yeah, yeah been, much, been a, yeah. A, a massive change in my lifetime. Mm. Problem with product safety and safe buildings is those are not in the hands of one person. You know, it's a relay race. Mm. And therefore, we need to regulate it as a relay race. So those are the building blocks of a good system, I think. Yeah, very good. Do you want to just recap on those just for the... Yeah, so standards that deliver yeah. what they claim, the performance that they claim to deliver. Um, a means of testing those uh, or assessing those uh, products to make sure they do comply and do indeed deliver the performance required. Yeah. Um, a chain of custody. Yeah. Of which the golden thread is a part to make sure that the product is what it claims to be that it's been honestly marketed and that what arrives on site, this yeah. could just be a matter of labelling, what arrives on site is as is indeed what it says it is and the thing that has been tested. Yeah. Um, and that works, by the way, whether you're talking about a, you know, a statutory process or, or a voluntary one. You know, how yes. can I be sure nonetheless that yeah. what, you know, if you're completely outside the regulated sector, yeah. then what I'm getting is what you claim it's to be. Yeah. Um, ne- next, an, an enforcement system. Yeah. Uh, over, and more, more importantly, uh, surveillance and enforcement. You know, yeah. watch the market, and of course that also becomes part of the feedback mechanism for continuous improvement. Yeah. Thirdly, body of knowledge. So, fourthly, body of knowledge, and then five and uh, connected to that, I've lost, I lost my numbering sequence. No, body knowledge is five. Yes. Yeah. yeah um, good. It's five, and and uh, feedback mechanism, which is directly linked to body of knowledge, but yeah. investigation of incidents and learning the lessons of that. You know, why that? If we then sort of jump to the exist this regulatory system that a product manufacturer confronts, yes, um, and how that might change, which is hugely uncertain, uh, because there's although there's a, a new environment under the Building Safety Act for those who run buildings, accountable persons, and those who um, construct them, principal contractor, and those who design them, principal designer, and all of those. We're starting to work on the competence of those people um, and the processes by which they deliver a safe building. Product manufacturers um, are still substantially operating in the um, pre-Brexit, pre-Building Safety Act environment. So how might that change, I I wonder? And what are the choices facing a manufacturer? Well, there are quite clear requirements still where there was a European harmonised standard, now imported to the UK as a designated standard. Your product, can and has to be marked. Uh, yeah. And we have all the you know, um, mess, bluntly, around when we're going to switch from a, from a European mark, CE, to a UK mark, UK CA. Just for clarity <laughs> on that, just for the for the listener again, I was just going to say is um, mm-hmm. all the harmonised, we've adopted all the harmonised standards and made them designated Every standards. Every harmonised standard um, has been imported into the UK as a designated, designated standard, standard yes. and therefore anything that was previously covered by the construction products regulation still is. Still is, yes. The change yeah. is made when we import it and not material. Yeah. And um, currently the marks you're referring to are the C mark and the UK CA mark. Well, originally, yes, we, we, we were in, in our post-Brexit enthusiasm going to introduce a UK mark, mm. um, um, and that was originally required to be uh, in place by January 2022. Yeah. Whereafter, you could not put your product on the market in the UK if it was only CE marked. Yes, yeah. Uh, that was moved to January 23. Yeah. And the need to do that was entirely predictable when we were doing the review. Um, and it was now um, June 2025. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> There's no clarity about no. it. No. So uh, for, um, now, for now, CE marking is... is Alive and well, so to speak, and, yes. and very much. And in current. other sectors, it's been continued indefinitely. It is yes, in construction. Yeah. It's yeah. been continued until yeah. it's at the end of June or beginning end of June, I think, isn't it? Yeah, um, twenty twenty five. Yeah. Um, now you kind of need to know, yeah. really, quite soon. Yeah, of course, and possibly yeah. sooner than was appreciated when they previously kicked that can yes, down the road. Yes, yeah. Because uh, there could be a few more important things to a business than whether you can put your product on the market at all. Exactly. Yes. So absolutely. you know, what are the rules going to be? <laughs> and and of course, it's not an overnight business to suddenly have no. to if you've got a product that isn't yet marked to get it marked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have to change all your labelling, probably. You know, there's a whole lot of stuff. You, 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 lot of, to, you might yeah. need to retest. You know, and just yeah. secure testing t- uh, time in a, in a market that is undersupplied and so on. So that decision needs to be made. 
Um, but nonetheless, as we understand it today, um, the, the situation today it, it, for a product for which there is a harmonised standard, straight designated standard, is the same as it was before Brexit. Yes, yeah. Uh, and you then have, have to go to market uh, with a mark and you have to go through the AVCP system we've already described yes, yes. in all its complexity. And the standard tells you the level of the AVP system through which you need to pass to get yourself yeah. assessed. Um, and, you know, who, who can do that and, and how, how it's done. Just on your point about um, things may change and the uncertainty, whatever, one, one of our perspective on that is that standards, some standards, some regulations or current standards, current regulations, whilst they may be imperfect, and I'm sure people can have a, have a you know, criticise what's in place, we think that's better than nothing. And, and if we all say, well, we're not going to comply with this standard or that standard or this regulation because it may change in the future, it may, mm -hmm. you know, and it will be better, is we very much, very quickly have a situation where we've got no standards and regulation at all, which would be obviously a very unsafe place to be in, in the fire, yeah. fire product Co industry. Correct. So we're, we're big advocates of, you know, of, of, of current standards and current regulations yeah. and, and, and complying with those. And I think the OPSS, is, that's, that's what they've got to play with as well, haven't they? Yeah, yes. I mean, I think some standards could possibly be worse than nothing at all, but it's quite hard to think of any. Well, you know, <laughs> if, they, if, they, if they give the illusion of safety yeah. and in fact they don't Complacency. It. No, yeah. well, it's, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a very valid point that... Um, <clears throat> I think we we um, we touch on that with a particular stand in the fire curtain industry, which is around installation, and the intent is absolutely right to have a code of practice for essentially third party approval of installation. What we've actually seen on the ground is is it's not necessarily giving the results hoped for. Mm -hmm. um, but the trouble is, is the you know the RP the you know whoever the person is responsible is they're potentially leaning on that piece of paper, like you say, yep. as going, well, I'm fine because I've got this piece of paper. Mm. When in reality, what we say is the best way of knowing if your product's going to work or not is actually in your weekly fire test. Yep. Yep. You know, and, and, mm. and that's the proof of the pudding. That's Yeah. So that's where yeah, it, is, it is a point. That there probably is a very small number of where you could get a false, so. a false it, sense of again, complacency. Or, yeah. They're all capable of being improved. And so you just keep, you know, so, so all the way yeah. through this, you know, it's IS 9001 language, continuous improvement, continue, you know, yeah. learn, learn, learn yeah. and improve. You know? But as you say, let's start. And I often quote G.K. Chester, instead of a job's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. You know, in other words, I don't think it means literally set out to do it badly, no. but let's get going. It's yes. another way of saying that the perfect is the enemy of the good, I think. Yeah, no, and back in my, back in my, my yeah. construction advisor days, you know, we, we kicked off a mandate for going to digital, BIM, the BIM mandate. And if we'd listened to the voices around us about, you know, oh, we're going to work out this first and you've got to work out that out first, it wouldn't have happened. No. The answer is let's just dive in. Yeah, perfect can so, be the enemy of done, can't correct. it? That's right. And um, what's the yeah, old saying? Yeah, a good, a good yeah. plan executed this week is better than a perfect plan I would, sometime I would in say, the future. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the other route, if you want to get your product marked, and you might, you know, um, if you think that it's a, a mark of something, we'll, let's look at that in a minute, uh, is a technical assessment process. Exactly where that sits in the UK is perhaps not too clear. I mean, at the moment it's been imported and, and the language is there and so on. Uh, but the organisations that would do it, technical assessment bodies, one of the two kinds of approved bodies, um, uh, don't have the same kind of organisational oversight as they do when they're in Europe, where they work together. And, that's, and, and the obligation to work together is funded by the EU. That is not happening here. But nonetheless, there is a route to market on which you can yeah. get your product marked. I don't imagine that many people are going to be following it until there's more clarity about marking. Because mm. one of the questions we asked you know, of, of the department, um, then MHCLG, now DLUC, was what's marking for? I was rather surprised to get the answer, well, it's for, it's for a single market, which, of course, is the weakness of the whole system. It's designed for a single market. Yeah, you touch on not, that. Yeah, yeah, not for safety or quality or anything else. No. Um, yeah, but we're out of a single market, so what's it for now? And I think... Just on that point, would you say mm. one of the barriers, um, the point of the marking and, 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 yeah, single market, would you say one of the barriers is actually safety, though, by almost, maybe not by plan, but by, in reality, is, is you can't, unless you comply with these safety requirements, essentially, you don't have access to that market, do you? No, you you need to do it if you want to sell your product. Yes. But it, it, I guess got my... Back to my point about you might be misled by what it means. Yes, there was an article in the Times a couple of weeks ago, maybe, about the indefinite extension of uh, CE recognition for most products. Yes, yeah. 
uh, with some exceptions. And it consistently talked about the mark as a safety mark. And it isn't a safety mark. It's a mark that you'll comply with a standard. Mm. Um, it, for some of those standards, there are aspects that are not tested for safety. And a classic example which will come out of Grenfell is toxicity. You know, that products are generally not tested for, for uh, their potential to be toxic in conditions of stress or particularly fire. Uh, but that is not a standard that's tested. It's not a point that's tested. Um, and indeed, uh, if we are going to continue to adopt the European approach, we can't add a test for toxicity because that would be a barrier to trade. So there are massive complexities in this, which is why I imagine, I think these conversations I assume are going on in DLUC now because there's a huge question of mm. whether you align yourself with Europe, not in our gift, of course, but do we negotiate for alignment of some yeah. kind? Yeah. Um, or, or do we diverge? Um, both of those things have an upside and a downside, like most difficult decisions. Yes. You know, yeah. The, the, the uh, upside of, of convergence or alignment is that the systems are all there and we can continue to, to, to use them. The downside is we can't improve them to any significant degree for those things that are covered by a standard. And the other thing is we can't introduce stringent new standards uh, which will lock out of the UK market products which are perfectly saleable in Europe. Yes, yeah. Uh, the uh, equivalent upside and downside of of uh, divergence are the opposite. You know, we can improve standards without negotiation um, at the risk of p presenting a barrier to trade that we may not want to erect, you know, because some products might no, no longer exactly, decide yeah. that they're worth importing here and we need them. Um, uh, uh, but also the downside is we have to recreate the structures that exist in Europe exactly. to set standards, to, to create an you know, the whole accreditation yeah, it's a massive, infrastructure. And massive stuff. question that, isn't it? So, so those are the big things. And I think, I think the truth is those decisions can never be made and implemented this side of an election. Um, and so we're kind of guessing. Uh, and if you look at, you know, how long it takes really genuinely to get something new in place. Uh, if you just take the mandate for a second staircase uh, in, in high-risk high buildings, which I think was announced by my Secretary of State in December 2022, um, this has not yet gone to consultation on the detail. So it may be maybe the end of the year, you know, we could, we could mm. know what the detail is. So it's sort of two years from decision to implementation. One of the um, things that you br bring up there about, you know, being having the um, the capability if we, if we diverge from Europe and we and we have our own standards and, and what have you is um, one of the weaknesses of that. I mean, that's great for the big mainstream products where there's plenty of money, you might say, to pay for everything and pay mm -hmm. for the the um, the cabs, um, the conformity assessment bodies to to run and to develop schemes and to have them accredited by UCAS and 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 offer them to industry. Um, where it struggles to stand up commercially for those people, because everyone, as you say, has to make some money at the end of the day, is where you've got slightly more niche products and there's just not the number of, say, manufacturers to support a scheme developed by a cab, you know, that's accredited by um, by UCAS. And then you then got the danger of where do those products sit? You know, do they just stay sort of fairly free-floating, as it were, or do they retain alignment with the European system that's in place? Well, I think that kind of brings us on to what we could do. You know, I, I think the, the next point to make after saying this isn't going to be decided until after election is uh, that nonetheless we are not powerless as an industry. And I think now the moving has to be by the industry in the first instance. There's a concern um, that what we're required to do to demonstrate what we're doing, if you, if you follow that, you know, the records we might be required to keep the processes we might need to get independently verified and so on, those could change as a matter of regulation. But one thing doesn't change, which is what product by product, manufacturer by manufacturer, designer by designer, constructor by constructor, accountable person by accountable person, what those people think is meant by safe. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't change. You can't get a good answer to that question yet, but we're sorely clever enough to start working on a good answer. Mm. And I think the driver for that will be the duties that we expect to be created. As of October last year, a time bomb was planted in the office of every building owner, uh, every uh, contract, principal contractor, every principal designer, which is the, the requirement to confirm compliance. 
And I've, lots of people said to me, well, you know, designers said to me, I don't, it doesn't apply to me, I don't do higher risk buildings. No, it's all buildings. Mm. So that's a kind of time bomb that is very little understood at the moment, I think. But suddenly... Does everyone have a duty of care responsibility yes. for that as well? Yeah. yeah and that, and, and, we can't and just the, point fingers. The duty, of course, is to produce a compliant building. Mm. Um, and I think there's an issue which is um, too tedious to get into as to whether the duty on a manufacturer might be consistent with that. But because construction, for the most part, is never going to be in one pair of hands from start to end, that's his, mm. both its weakness and, you know, and, uh, and a bit of reality of its marketplace, it's always going to be a relay race. And you can invent some kind of super single point of responsibility. You could call it PFI, if you like. Mm. You know. But then political motivation, you know, failures of that kind of working, whatever you design a yeah. procurement system, it will have failed somewhere, so somebody tries something else. There will always be a relay race. Yeah. Um, so the important thing is a continuous handing of, of, of duties through the process. And I think that the, the general safety requirement, which is um, running in the bloodstream of OPSS, and which has the convenience politically of applying to everything, so no longer would, could anybody say this disaster is a consequence of a regulatory lacuna, there's a you know, gap in the system, you mm. haven't covered something and you should have done government. Mm. General safety requirement will cover everything. Uh, and when I first thought about it, I was made nervous by it. Um, and, and to a degree, I've, I've been converted by thinking on. The, the problem is we don't really know what it is. You know, what duties does it actually create and so on? Um, it's very hard to recognise on the shelf. So how does a trading standards officer say this product fails to comply with the general safety requirement? Products only make sense when they're in their finished use, and you know, and probably only fail when they're in the finished use, or at least de you know, demonstrably fail in their finished use. By which time, it isn't about the product; it could be about is anything it, along the way. Is it too simplistic to say safe is is um, the definition of safe is that it performs its intended function in in the application it's intended to be used in? That might not when, be when enough because then you would say that the, the without intent, causing the intended. The intended application is to comply with the standard, but if the standard doesn't make safe, and you know that, there should be an additional application. Why I converted to the idea is, number one, is a simple thing. Who could argue against the idea that a product should be safe? You know, it's, yes, it's yeah. therefore about definition and process mm. to, to, to demonstrate safety that matters. Um, I like it because it covers everything, but I also like it because it's, it, it's capable of us working out for ourselves what it means uh, and then to be continuously improved. So I think for a product manufacturer now, what are the steps that you take to demonstrate that your product is safe? You might be required to demonstrate that in a different way, regulatory terms, but the thinking can be done now. Mm. And if you've done ISO 9001, mm. for example, and you, you've taken it seriously in your business, not just, oh, we want to be able to stick this on our letterhead, yes, but you know, yeah. look, let's use this to understand whether we're doing mm. things in a, in a way that delivers quality you know, start, start securing customer satisfaction and feedback, mm. start feeding and continuous improvement to our processes. That kind of thinking is going on out there already. It's of not course, like, yeah. oh, we yeah. currently thought, I don't know, let's make a fire curtain, throw it on the market, see what happens. Nobody yes. does that. No. Um, so we could start to say there are certain obligations that you should follow, certain things that you should do in support of a duty to be deliver a safe product. And that will grow. It will be imperfect when we first yeah. do it, yeah. but it will grow. And I, and I think that, th therefore, almost irrespective of what the industry, of what might be coming out of regulation, now we should think, you know, what should our factory processes look like? What should our re pre-market risk assessment look like? So that when the time we get to the CCPI, the code by which we're marketing and informing about our product, before we get to that, are we sure that the things should be in the marketplace in the first place? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, we're <coughs> no, just going to say we're um, mm -hmm. we'll be coming to the end on the time. So, just okay. going to say if we can have a mm -hmm. little um, maybe deep dive into um, what we talk about. The so we touched on ISO 9001 there, and then we've also discussed um, the AVCP system. Um, what would you say in terms of if somebody says, you know, ISO 1001 is, is almost like a substitute for having valid third party certification with what the AVCP maybe under a system one demands? Would you, um, would you, would you be able to I think the other that? benefit of general safety requirement, relevant to your question, yeah, it, yeah. is that it could become a means to proportionality. In yeah. other words, for most products, 
You don't need a very prescriptive process. You just, we just need to know that you are obliged to follow a process that delivers a safe product. And your offence, if you don't, yeah. would be failing to use duty and care to deliver a safe product. Yeah. You can then drop off at the lower levels of the AVCP system. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if the consequences of you failing are that people suffer serious injury or death, yeah. then Life it's safety. not enough that safety is generally done. It, it yeah. matters that safety is seen to be done. Yeah. And here, and, and, and this is an answer to your 9001 question, because all of that satisfies you that yeah. you're doing things in a proper way. Yeah. But at some level, your customers and your end users uh, uh, and maybe maybe the, the regulator needs to know that you can demonstrate that you've done that, and that yeah. means independence. Yeah. And, and I think that's for safety-critical products. We don't need to get bogged down in how you define safety-critical products, no. but anything that's in fire compartmentation, I would say very quickly, is in category one of yeah. safety-critical products because if the compartment holds, yeah. for the most part, the damage is contained. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anybody making a product, I think, which is, which is life and safety-critical, um, whether or not there's a harmonised standard for it, yes, yeah. should be going through some kind of independently verified process, yeah. third-party certification, and yeah. I wouldn't trust it if they didn't. You no. know, I wouldn't feel comfortable. No. Because of the fact that, not that I don't trust you, it's just that, you know, how can I know, actually? Uh, well, every, everyone <laughs> sort of does what's right, sort of in their own eyes, so to speak. I mean, that's a bit of a general statement, but I, we've got some scenarios on, on, one, of our pay, on one of our articles where... Um, you may have a situation where a manufacturer is, is you know, he's got a, you know, talk about us, say, for example, we may have to deliver some fire curtains before Christmas on a job and there's some big damages at stake. And then the motor manufacturer says, to, the motor that we've had fire tested, manufacturer says, oh, it's a 16-week lead time. You know, what do we do in that situation? You know, do we face the penalties or do we, you know, sit in our boardroom and go, right, guys, we know this other fire-rated motor will actually do the job, it'll be fine. Um, let's substitute it out. We can deliver on time. You know, I've got a clear conscience about that because that's my judgment. But I'm making essentially a commercially, you might say, driven or biased or influenced decision, yeah. which is not, um, it's an untested one. And we'd say, and that's where we say, you know, the system one or system one plus, as it's called, we've got ongoing production sampling. So, you know, it's not announced. It's, it's um, you know, um, unplanned, you know, an external independent assessment that I'm actually making that fire kit, for example, the same day-to-day -day as what was fire tested. Well, this gets us to what a good third-party scheme looks like. If you're not an AVCP system, what you just suggested somebody might do would be an offence because you've changed the product that's been tested and marked. And so yeah. if you put that mark on a product that hasn't gone through that process, that's an offence. Or even under Trade Descriptions <clears throat> Act, if you say this is a third-party tested product, yeah. But you've actually selling that not the same as what was tested. That's an offence, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, probably I shouldn't go there because or... of the complexities of enforcement under okay. under all the other forms. It, yeah, yeah it, there's a very right. dull chapter of the of the, of the review about yeah. the 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 duties that are out there now and actually how they're very hard to bring to bear unless you're usually unless you're a consumer as opposed okay. to a professional. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that, that under a third party scheme, I can imagine a circumstance in which what you've just described would be perfectly legitimate. But the third party scheme would need to be very clear about how you demonstrate that the motor that you substituted would deliver the same performance as the one before. So you would get to two right. things, I think, and maybe two final points about third party certification, which they ain't all good, no. first of all. Uh, and so I think one piece of work, and it's again in the review, that the industry should do in the first instance, but clearly working with those who are credit processes, UCAS and UCAS's overseers, which is now OPSS, what does a good third-party scheme look like? You know, um, so I, I don't trust. You know, how could I trust all third-party schemes when you know, they, uh, some of them lack essential, you know, essential independent steps in them? And so, on. so we should do some work on what a good third-party scheme mm. looks like. And the second important point to make, I think, is the value of third-party schemes that follow the product into its final years. Because if you, as a certain exercise done by the Guild of Ironmongers, if that's if that's their right name, I forgive me, forgive me if it's not, you know, into fire door uh, installation, finding that I think it was the majority of them uh, were not properly installed. Mm. So we have a, a very mature, in you know, both senses of the word, well developed, you know, uh, um, and grown up industry making timber yep. fire doors in particular. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's product which is demonstrated at Grenfell when tested passes. And yet over and over again, it seems that they are being improperly installed on site. So 
how do you follow the thing and right the way down? And so a third party the, certification yeah. scheme. And again, we could decide sector by sector. As long as we bear in mind the long-term commercial interest, what a good scheme would look like and what it should require. So should it require testing? Should that testing be independently verified? How often should you test and retest and so on? What kind of factory production control process you know, uh, ensures consistent, consistent quality? So you, know, that you make sure your instrumentation works, that your machinery works, that your process is replicated. No point having a standard if you can't consistently deliver to it. All of that kind of stuff we could start saying, you know, that if we want a third-party certification scheme to mean something, it should have these characteristics and meet these requirements of us, mm. all the way through to should the final installation be inspected independently and verified, signed off as conforming all the way back. We don't need regulation to tell us what ought to happen in those circumstances. We don't need, um, we shouldn't need customers to tell us what they want because why would they understand all of it? But you should start to be able to grow the market on the understanding that if you ask for this thing, you get something which is better than something that hasn't got it. Yeah. Uh, and it's making a promise to you. Yes, yeah, yeah. And starts to address the fundamental lack of trust that is a consequence of on, Grenfell and will be when the Grenfell inquiry is published. Yeah, absolutely. On, on um, the, the scenario, the example I gave there about the motors, you know, maybe swapping one out, you could take five motors from the original equipment manufacturer um, they could all look pretty much identical, but they could have different oils, different greases, different amount of aluminium casing or whatever, and they could all have different performances in a fire, more firing outside of the head box, for example. Um, the only way of actually checking that is actually by doing a fire test as a built product in reality. Fine, then you said that you've set, you've set the standard for a proper uh, you know, third-party accreditation system. You should not be able to substitute unless you've done a fire test. Absolutely not, And yeah. I think, you know, that's... You know, I'm assuming you have competitors, most of us do, yeah, who may have yeah. a different view, but at yeah. some point there is a view that generally represents what protects the public, and I think that's yeah. that's what it should be in a good third-party yeah. assessment scheme. And if you've yeah. got, of course, if your third-party scheme is overseen by somebody properly accredited, they will have a view as well. Of course, yeah. yeah. Such as uh, UCASH, you mean, or...? Well, the testing house, the, oh, the, the, testing the, house, the, yeah. the um, body that uh, you cast yeah. would accredit to oversee your your, your program and so on. And, yeah. I, and, and there's a fundamental role here for trade associations. Mm. I think trade associations are increasingly moving away from just being lobbying organisations to being organisations that, A, um, equip their members to make a good living, in, the, in the, an honest living in the world, yeah. you know, with the necessary skills and so on and so forth, but also start to demonstrate that our members do something which is worth something to you. But by own you know, professional institution, I would like people to think that because I've got their letters after my name, mm. they get something that they don't get without them. Without them, yes. Yeah. Um, and if we had another hour, I'd tell you what those things should be. Yes, um, yeah. but, but for products, it's a bit clearer, I think. So back to your headline theme of third-party accreditation. In the context of this uh, long but, but a lot shorter than reading the report summary of what the report says. Um, I, I think trade by trade, sector by sector, led by trade associations probably, uh, we need to get in place proper descriptions of what you should do to deliver a safe product um, and market it honestly and sell it honestly and so on, and give all the information downstream needs to make sure it stays safe, um, and also where that needs independent oversight. Or well, whether there's a commercial benefit of independent oversight, it doesn't have to be. You know, if a sector decides well, we want to separate ourselves from those who don't have independent verification, that's fine. Yeah. But we can make decisions about when you should do that in the public interest. Yeah. Now we're we're big advocates of ongoing factory production control and and the third party certification. You know, as we say, you know, it might not be perfect. Um, but is the regular independent assessment and auditing? So, you know, is the design still as the design that was fire tested? Are the components still as the components that were fire tested? Is the assembly of those components, you know, the positioning of them? We've, you know, I mentioned to you about, you know, we might position the motor in the barrel, I might recess it 400 mil into the barrel to pass a certain test in a standard, and then I come to production and find that's awkward or, or just not very practical to mass produce. So I then make a, an in house decision to maybe just put the motor right at the end of the barrel. Would it still Pass that fire test. We don't know, um, but we, we're big advocates, big big um, believers in that ongoing third party independent um, inspection mm. of production. You know, sampling, um, actually checking that the product that's leaving the factory arriving on site is the same as what was fire tested. We believe that the only real way of knowing, you know, you talk about systems, but even a product is a system in a way. It's of made up of a number of, of components. We only know that. You know, there used to be a lot more. 
I think, leeway or, or, or tendency to do desktop assessments, they're called. Um, I think that is becoming more of a thing of the past. And we need to know that when you put all those components together, you know, do they perform in a file like they're intended to? Well, I think desktop assessment also have a place. Yes, I mean, most yeah. design is a desktop assessment. Yeah. The point is when it's not enough, you know, when, when, when an individual enough. judgment is yeah. not enough or when a judgment made by anybody is not yeah. enough. Maybe no. maybe it's just, you know, okay, you can make a judgment, but it needs to be made by somebody yeah. with this qualification. Yeah. All the things you've described, I should say, should happen in any business. You, they may not call it, you know, <laughs> factory production control. No. You may not be required to demonstrate it to a third party, but who no. can run a factory without yes. having a production control system? Yes, exactly. So, yeah. so the, all those things should happen anyway. Mm. And what the general safety requirement, what we're thinking about the general safety requirement would be, yeah. was therefore, do we you know, have a system that, 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 that stands up? Mm. And it, I think it will start driving people towards programs like mm. CCPI. Yes, yeah. Uh, and I would hope in the future, like you know, a factory production control protocol, call yeah. it what you will, framework yeah. system, you know, because it won't work for, you can't have one system for every kind of business and every no. kind of product, but you could say, well, these are the bones of such a system, like yeah. my building blocks of a good product yeah. regulation system. These are the bones of that. And then, at what point do we, or does government decide all of that needs to be independently verified in the interest of public safety? Yes, we don't need help to get to the first point. What should we be doing? Well, yeah, thanks very much for joining us today, Paul, and, and talking over that. Um, anybody that's um, got a spare day, potentially, or two to read the report, <laughs> I, I'd, I'd highly recommend it. It's um, very, very in-depth. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's good just to talk over how, how we can make construction products safer for everyone, really, mm. and it's ultimately for the consumer, isn't it? Oh, well, I hope so. As I say, I don't think anyone needs to read all of it. Uh, and, and because the brief was to... to lay out the current system and then think about improvements. The first half is doing the former necessary to make sure we've got it right. But I think, you know, the, the back half, is, you know, the, the beginning of the report and the end of the report are worth reading, I think. The executive uh, the, summary. The headlines are there. And the, um, yeah. Or they can just watch this podcast. Yeah, or watch this podcast, exactly. Good. Thanks a lot, Paul. Okay, Thanks for joining Jeff. us. You're most welcome. S okay. See you soon. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed the Adexon Fire Safety Insights podcast with Paul Morell on valid third party certification and going over his report that he put together with Annalise Day, the Morell Day report, which we hope will be guiding us towards a safer future for construction products. If you want to hear more or if you'd like to have a REBA accredited CPD, which goes over fire curtains specifically and includes updates to regulations and standards, please be in touch. And you can get us through the website www.adexon-uk.com. Or you can call us on 0151 422 9 Look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.